The lecturer is Kenneth W. Harl. Dr. Harl is professor of classical and Byzantine history at Tulane University, where he has taught for more than 30 years. A specialist in ancient Mediterranean civilizations and a veteran field researcher, he serves on the editorial board of the American Journal of Archaeology. Professor Harl has earned Tulane's Student Body Award for Excellence in Teaching on multiple occasions. On October 28th in the year 312 AD, God wrought a miracle for His chosen people, the new Israel. Uh, they may have been relatively few in numbers, uh, but the belief is that they were rising in importance and significance in the Roman world. On that day, the 28th of October, the Roman Emperor Constantine defeated a rival emperor named Maxentius, who controlled the city of Rome. And the great battle was fought at the historic Milvian Bridge just north of Rome, where many important events had occurred earlier in Roman history. From our literary accounts of the battle, we know that Constantine lured Maxentius into an ill-advised attempt to cross the Milvian Bridge. Maxentius, realizing that his army was much too large uh, to be accommodated by that bridge, had built a second pontoon bridge parallel to it. And so his army proceeded to cross over to the north bank of the Tiber, and it was ambushed by Constantine soldiers who had emerged from concealment and drove the initial columns of Maxentius's army back onto those two bridges. Maxentius himself could do very little to rally his men. Uh, his soldiers were panicked. We are told that Maxentius, uh, astride his horse, uh, tried to rise, ride through the ranks, rally his men. He was swept by the crowd of refugees onto the pontoon bridge, and the bridge collapsed under the weight of all these uh, frightened soldiers. Maxentius himself was thrown from his horse and later found drowned, and his head was cut off and paraded around Rome. Uh, this is what is known as legitimacy in the late Roman world. This battle was not particularly remarkable in its fighting. In fact, it was pretty typical of the types of war, battles that were fought in the civil wars of the uh, late Roman world. But it was significant because on the previous day, there had been a miracle. Eusebius, who lived between the years 260 and 340 AD, uh, and is the first uh, historian of the Christian movement, Eusebius wrote of this battle, and his account, he claims, was given to him by the Emperor Constantine himself, although uh, this is some 30 years after the event. According to Eusebius, Constantine told him that the day before, in the late afternoon, in the failing sun, that Constantine and his entire army had witnessed a miracle. Apparently, the skies had parted, and in a flood of light, uh, there was an image of the Chi Rho, that is, the Chi Rho, uh, the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek, Christos, or what is often known as the Christogram, which combines the two letters. They look like the English letters X and P. And along with this was apparently an inscription uh, in Latin. Uh, one version of it is, in hoc signo victor eris. Uh, the emperor was struck by it, as was the army. They were amazed. And not too long afterwards, the emperor fell asleep. And in that sleep, uh, Christ appeared in a dream and admonished Constantine to trust into the symbol, put it on a banner, which is known as the labarum. And so Constantine went into battle under a Christian symbol and won a decisive victory. Eusebius, the church historian and bishop, hailed Constantine's conversion as the triumph of Christianity. And Constantine was compared uh, to Moses, to David, that is, the new lawgiver, uh, the new righteous king. Now, the report of Constantine's conversion, particularly this report that has come down to us from Eusebius, has produced a lot of controversy among scholars and popular writers. Many have questioned the motives of Constantine's conversion. Some have even questioned the genuineness of it. Uh, but there is very little doubt, until quite recently, that Constantine's conversion essentially was the final act of a rising, powerful Christian movement. In effect, Constantine put his seal of approval on important religious changes that had been going on in the Roman world for nearly three centuries. 
And Eusebius' account uh, is consistent with this vision. In fact, this vision and this interpretation of the rise of Christianity in the Roman world largely hinges on Eusebius' ecclesiastical history, and the Battle of the Milvian Bridge is essentially the climax to the entire movement. However, this vision, which has been inherited from Eusebius, has problems with it. And in some ways, accepting this interpretation, that Constantine, in effect, uh, gave uh, his approval to a successful and important Christian movement, uh, produces more problems than it solves with the existing evidence. For one, we know Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion. Contrary to what one might read in certain popular accounts, this did not come until almost uh, three generations later in the laws of the Emperor Theodosius I in 391, 392. Constantine did not even ban pagan worship or close pagan temples. Many of them continued to operate for long after his death. And above all, Constantine was clearly a pragmatic uh, emperor as well as a convert. And he essentially operated with a policy once attributed to the Emperor Augustus, who founded the Roman Empire, as to make, he made haste slowly. It is now clear, to scholars at least, that there were far fewer Christians in the Roman world in 312 than has previously been assumed. It is also clear that Christians did not occupy any significant positions in the imperial government or the army. And what is even more perplexing is that Constantine's nephew, the Emperor Julian, who had been baptized and reared as a Christian, in fact it was expected that he would become the Bishop of Constantinople, that this young imperial prince at age 20 embraced the worship of the old gods and when he became emperor sought to restore the gods. Now he failed. Nonetheless, Julian's efforts are an important reminder that the triumph of Christianity was hardly inevitable. And as uh, Peter Brown noted, um, and Peter Brown is probably one of the most brilliant of the cultural and religious historians of the late Roman world in this generation. As Peter Brown noted in a famous review article, Julian, if he had lived for 30 years rather than three years, if he had succeeded in his war in Persia under pagan symbols and not died prematurely in a skirmish, and if he had left pagan successors, Julian could well have reversed the religious developments in the Roman world. And in some ways, uh, what might have resulted, at least Brown suggests this as a possibility, as what we know happened in India, where the Brahmins and the Gupta emperors together rallied the cults of Hinduism and eventually mounted uh, an effort to restore the worship of traditional Hinduism uh, against the challenge of Buddhism. Therefore, in this course, uh, which is going to consist of 24 lectures, we are going to take as our task a way of explaining how did the Roman world become Christian. This is a fundamental question of, the, of, uh, of, of great importance because the Roman world at the start of uh, uh, the Roman Empire, let us take the year one, uh, at the time more or less of the birth of Christ, there's a dispute over the precise year of his birth, but at the, uh, when the Roman Empire had been established by the Emperor Augustus at the beginning of the first century AD, he ruled over a very, very traditional society in which the vast majority of peoples worship traditional gods, ancestral gods, Roman, Greek, and otherwise. And these gods were all bound up with rites and traditions and social values that had gone back for centuries. And society was hierarchical, it was traditional, and many of the residents of the Roman world were very, very reluctant to give up their view of their divine, their traditional rites, and embrace a new religion, the new faith of Christianity. And the conversion of the Roman world to Christianity between the first and sixth centuries is a major turning point in the Western tradition. In my mind, it is one of the four great moments that come to, to define the Western tradition. The first of those is the emergence of self-government in the Greek city-states and in the Roman Republic. The second is, of course, the conversion to Christianity and the whole change in religious and ethical perceptions from a pagan to a Christian, and those changes are going to dictate the course of Western civilization thereafter. And the last two, in my opinion, are the discovery of the New World and the expansion of Western civilization overseas due to a number of changes within uh, Northwestern Europe, and finally, the Industrial Revolution and the advent of the modern world as we know it today. And therefore, we are looking at one of those significant moments. 
I had mentioned Eusebius, and it is important to note for a moment uh, Eusebius because he is one of our prime sources. In fact, he is the only narrative account we have for the first three centuries of this course uh, because he sat down in the reign of Constantine, put together various documents, and explained the rise of the Christian movement. movement. There was never a doubt in Eusebius' mind that Christianity was the superior faith, that pagan cult statues were idols, and that Christians were the new Israel and therefore the heirs to the, pro to the Hebrew prophets. He also has a vision of a single Christian church. In fact, our notion of church, capital C, comes from Eusebius. And we will see in this course that the Christians themselves were by no means unified even after the time Constantine had converted and summoned the first ecumenical council in 325 to achieve a unity within the various churches of the Roman world. In addition, uh, Eusebius drew upon the writings of earlier Christian authors, notably apologists. Apologists are authors who wrote early defenses of the faith. And it comes from the Greek word apologia, which means a defense, an exposition. And it's a term that is borrowed from uh, Greek philosophy and Greek literature. The most famous apologia is, of course, Plato's rendition of the defense that Socrates gave at his trial before an Athenian jury in 399 BC. Now, the word has changed into an excuse in modern English, but apology or apologia in its Greek uh, sense means a concerted defense of any kind of position. Two of the earliest apologists that have come down to us are Justin the Martyr in Greek and Tertullian, a powerful intellect, uh, one of the earliest Christian writers in Latin. And they both agreed that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that means that the Roman imperial government, which persecuted the Christians, starting in the reign of Nero in the year 64, down to a year after the conversion of Constantine, the final persecution ends in 313, uh, the year after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, that these efforts by the imperial government to persecute Christians actually uh, turned out to uh, be a rather foolish policy. It backfired. That is, for every Christian martyr who went into the arena and died for his faith, Many pagans were moved to inquire about Christianity, perhaps to convert to Christianity. The imperial government unwittingly gave a prominence to the Christian movement that the Christian movement itself could never have achieved. And this is a position that is held by many Christian writers of the uh, period of the Roman world, later in the medieval world, and it is a vision that is presented by Eusebius in his narrative account, and one that has influenced modern and popular scholars down to this day we will have reason to question this vision. As comfortable and powerful as the vision is, again, we have to balance this vision, which comes from a Christian author, with other types of evidence. Nonetheless, uh, this position that was um, uh, uh, expounded by Eusebius uh, is absolutely important to understand if one is to turn to the issue of how did the Roman world become Christian? And uh, some of the earliest scholarship, modern scholarship, which essentially starts in the late 19th century, is very much premised on this vision. The foremost important book is by Otto von Harnack, a German scholar writing in the early 20th century. His work was first published in 1902. It was revised in 1924. It was published immediately in uh, English. And the English translation is The Mission and Expansion of Christianity in the First Three Centuries. Von Harnack did a major service to all scholars since. We all have to use his work. Von Harnack went through all the Christian sources and some of the pagan sources available to him. There were certain types of evidence he did not have access to. But all of the literary tradition, that is all of the literature that has come down to us in antiquity, he combed those sources and came up with the information available on the nature of the early Christian movement, their numbers, their locations, geography, and it's a real scatter of information. But if you're going to start to attack the question, this is still an important work. The most brilliant uh, exposition of this position, drawing on von Harnack's work, is written by a great British scholar, W.H.C. Friend, uh, and it is known as Martyrdom and Persecution in the Early Church. It was published in 1965. It has been re-released re in, in various editions. It is a brilliant read. It is a magisterial 
and well-written work that explains the rise of Christianity against the available sources. Friend does try to take into account some of the pagan sources, but fundamentally it is a modern version of that vision of Eusebius. Um, in addition to these scholars who've worked through the Christian material, scholars who are of a classical background, such as myself, who is the, um, uh, giving this course, uh, we have been trained um, in the ancient uh, texts, the pagan texts, and we come at the question from a different angle. We're not so concerned about Christianity alone, but want to look at the whole issue of pagan um, uh, and uh, paganism, religious change in general. And again, uh, a crucial work in this direction was uh, written by an author, Arthur Dobby Knox. Uh, it was released in 1933, a rather fateful year in European history. Uh, the work is titled Conversion, and it is looking at the various uh, religious forces, social changes, bringing about religious change in the Roman world between the time of Alexander the Great and the time of Constantine. Uh, Knox's work was seminal. It raised a whole number of issues as to exactly what was the state of pagan worship at the time of the birth of Christ, at the time of the great persecutions, and finally at the time of the conversion of Constantine. That is those three vital centuries uh, that Eusebius writes about in his ecclesiastical history, or his history of the Christian movement, which is a probably more accurate rendition of the work. Um, in Knox's view, you are not dealing with the paganism of Greek mythology. Instead, you're dealing with the paganism that has undergone a great deal of change, in part due to the conquest of Alexander the Great and the incorporation of the Near East into an expanded Greek world that is usually known as Hellenistic. And then a good part of this Hellenistic world is incorporated into the great Mediterranean Empire of Rome. And so to think of paganism as essentially Greek mythology is extremely misleading. Uh, numerous cults that were either, uh, which were pre-Roman and which were neither Greek nor Roman uh, in origin, were part of the religions of the wider Roman world. This included the Celtic gods of Northwest Europe, uh, the gods of Syria, the ancient gods of the Nile Valley, and the numerous cults of Asia Minor, North Africa, the Balkan provinces. Now, some of these cults acquired a classical tinge. They were, that is, the native cults were identified with Jupiter in the West or Zeus in the East. That is, they took on a Latin or a Greek uh, aspect. But again, uh, uh, the diversity of paganism at the time of the Roman Empire was considerable. Furthermore, Knox was one of a number of important scholars who saw that the developments in pagan worship uh, uh, indicated that at the time of the birth of Jesus, uh, there may well have been some kind of spiritual crisis in the Roman world, perhaps already a decline or a flight uh, from the beliefs of the traditional gods. This approach actually worked very well with the vision uh, inherited from Eusebius. If Christianity is arising in an important movement, a significant movement at the time of Constantine's conversion, uh, it makes even more sense if the traditional gods of the Roman Empire were somehow on the wane. And this approach was pioneered by another um, leading scholar, the fourth I must make mention of because he is so fundamental, and that is a Belgian scholar, uh, Franz Cumont. Franz Cumont, at the depressing age of 28, wrote a book on the mysteries of Mithra. Uh, it was released in 1894, it has been reissued, it's an English translation, and what scholar can count over a hundred years later uh, that he still has four major books in print in all the major European uh, uh, languages? Cumont was a brilliant scholar. He understood archaeology, he understood inscriptions, that is, funerary monuments, public monuments inscribed on stone, which are a major source in the Roman world. He looked at all sorts of evidence, and, as, and in his first monograph, he took as his subject the god Mithra or Mithras, a god worshipped in the Roman army and by various peoples of the Roman Empire, but a god that was Persian in origin, who came from Iran. Cumont made a brilliant uh, suggestion that the Mithras of the Roman Empire was the Mithras referred in uh, the Avesta, that is the Zoroastrian text, that is the ancient Persian god, and that somehow Mithras of Persia had become a Roman god. 
From that position, he went on to look at other cults, which he called mystery cults, cults with initiation rites, cults in which membership was based on registering, choosing to join this cult over the traditional pagan cults, which were a matter of birth, a matter of one's residence. And Cumont built up an image that uh, dovetails very well with these notions of spiritual demise or crisis among the pagans, and that is uh, there was a new wave of enthusiastic, irrational cults, somehow cults that weren't classical, that were attracting pagans away from their traditional values and gods, and actually prepared them unwittingly, but prepared them to accept Christianity. And some scholars have gone so far as to claim that Christianity, in effect, was just a version of a mystery cult and the most successful of them. And this is a position that has been argued by some very serious scholars and, and by popular writers, and it is one of the major positions we must look at and reinterpret in light of new evidence and new scholarship. Another important trend that has been noticed by scholars is the development of philosophy particularly Roman Stoicism and the teachings of Plato, that is the Neoplatonists, we will be spending time talking about the philosophical systems. Again, uh, we are not going to engage in a course of philosophy anymore that we're going to engage in a course of theology. But it is important to explain the doctrines of the Stoics and of the Platonists in the Roman world because these were embraced as a moral code uh, by the literate classes of the Roman Empire. Uh, they were a way of interpreting the ancient gods uh, morally. And therefore, uh, the um, argument is often made that the philosophical systems, particularly those of the Stoics and of Plato, acted as a bridge whereby the educated and intellectual class would, classes would cross over to Christianity. And this particularly became the case in the third and fourth centuries as the Christians used the same philosophical language and terms to describe their own theology. And so uh, it is often argued that to some extent uh, we're not dealing so much with a religious conflict per se among the literate classes, but almost a debate among Stoics and Platonists as to who has the better interpretation of the divine, those who believe in the pagan gods or those who believe in the Christian god. There is some truth and some merit in this position, but again, it can be overdrawn. So our task is to look at this wider issue of religious change. How did a traditional society come to embrace a very, very different view of the divine? A Christian faith based on dogma, on texts, on a sense of morality and in institutions uh, that were universal from church to church, as opposed to pagan cults, which varied from one city to another, from one god to another. Furthermore, there's a major difference in the divine. Christians see a transcendent divine, a divine beyond this world, in which the Godhead is beyond time, beyond definition, whereas the pagans see the divine and the human is intermingled on this world. Anyone reading Greek mythology knows that. Zeus is always intermingling with humans, particularly sweet young things of both varieties, which he bushwhacks at various springs. And the usual pickup place in Greek mythology is to go down and do your laundry at a spring, and sure enough, Zeus or Ares or some such divinity is going to show up. Uh, that notion of the interpenetration of the divine and of the human uh, was a characteristic of all pagans, and pagans who, who confronted Christianity really found this transcendent God rather peculiar, and to them it was a rather sad definition of the divine, because you're removing the divine from immediate contact. You can't reach them in oracles and waking dreams or anything, and therefore the world is being emptied of, of, of the gods. Uh, and it would be very, very hard to convince many pagans that a transcendent god and a notion of monotheism, that is a one and single god, uh, really had any kind of validity. Uh, and so uh, the Christians faced a very tough audience. Not only did they have to bring across a new vision of the relationship of mundane and divine, they also had to go against ancestral pagan rites and beliefs that were intimately tied with cultural and social values, particularly in the cities of the Roman world. And one of our tasks is to look at how closely and deeply embedded pagan worship was in the entire fabric of life in the Roman world. And 
I have raised these questions to give you some sense of what we're going to cover in this course. We're going to be looking at common assumptions of the rise of Christianity, assumptions we've inherited from Eusebius, and particularly popular views that have been shaped by novels of the 19th century and movies of the 20th and 21st century. And we have to step back for a moment and remember that the inevitable rise of a superior Christian system with values of the modern world and all, and taking it for granted that Christians could spread their world around by preaching, as you would have in modern society, that has to be reconsidered. Novels, movies, like to play upon this popular image. One of my favorite movies is the movie Quo Vadis based on a famous novel in the 19th century, and uh, its title comes from the St. Jerome's translation of the Greek, where uh, Peter is going back to Rome and, Quo Vadis, where are you going? And it, it stars Robert Taylor and Deborah uh, Carr, but uh, it's really stolen by Peter Ustinov, who plays Nero in an absolutely wonderful sequence. Uh, but it's very much premised on the images that I've been talking about, uh, that Christians could preach, they could persuade uh, with the superior, uh, superiority of, of their message, and we'll find that there are real liabilities of trying to preach openly uh, to a pagan population. After 64 AD, Christianity is outlawed, and even St. Paul, before the outlawing of Christianity, ran into major problems if he tried to deny the existence of the traditional gods. You could start riots in cities such as Ephesus with no problem at all, particularly among the craftsmen who were selling uh, various statuettes of the goddess Artemis Ephesia, who's the patron goddess of the city. There is another fine uh, movie that uh, does bring about at least some sense of how Christianity uh, was uh, linked to Judaism. That's the famous Ben-Hur. It comes from the novel of Lew Wallace. Some of you who are Civil War buffs know that Lew Wallace lost the third division at Shiloh, and when he wasn't writing uh, his novel Ben-Hur, he was going back to Shiloh to justify why he didn't show up on the first day of battle. Uh, that aside, Charlton Heston plays Judah Ben-Hur. He does a great job. I, I always think that Jack Hawkins is as, as the Roman uh, Quintus Arius uh, probably does a better job uh, in stealing the movie. But nonetheless, it, it's at least to give some sense that Christianity was linked to the wider Jewish uh, religion. And uh, it's important to stress, and we'll do a whole lecture on Judaism to explain why Judaism played such a decisive role in the Roman world. Jews constituted a major population in the Roman Empire. They were significant in the Eastern Empire. Several times they revolted against Rome, and these were very dangerous rebellions. In addition, Christianity emerged out of Judaism, shared many of the uh, religious assumptions of Judaism, and uh, it is important to understand that the relationship between pagans and Jews uh, also would influence the relationship between uh, pagans and Christians, and particularly the imperial government in Christians. And some of this has been attempted in more recent films, uh, such as Mel Gibson's The Passion or uh, Martin Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ, uh, uh, two films uh, that were recently uh, released. And uh, all of these films and novels, again, are essentially premised on that vision that goes back to Eusebius. Our task is to look at these visions that we've inherited from Eusebius, look at a host of different uh, sources, Christian, Jewish, and pagan, to understand this great historical change. And the way this course is envisioned is the opening lectures, lectures two to five, are going to paint the world of paganism in all of its aspects. And I will lay put particular stress on Asia Minor to take today Turkey, because that's where I do a lot of my work. I know the archaeology, the coinage, the inscriptions very well. And Asia Minor is one of the very well-documented sections of the Roman world. And much of what goes on in Asia Minor is paralleled in many, at least, at least of the Mediterranean provinces of the Roman world. Then we need to give a lecture on the relationship of Rome and the Jews, and then follow a group of lectures, 7th to 11, that establishes early Christianity and its clashes with Rome.
The centerpiece is going to be the great persecutions of the third century. We will, those are lectures 12 through 15. There we shall test that image of were the blood of martyrs the seed of the church. That is, did martyrdoms win converts for Christianity and turn Christianity into a mass movement? And that raises the significant question with the quote that I started this lecture with, did Constantine simply give his seal of approval to an effective Christian movement that was rising in numbers and rising uh, in importance, or did Constantine in many ways create an imperial church and made Christianity a, a world religion uh, by his act of conversion and his support for that faith? And those are two very different positions, and we will be investigating that position uh, through the whole course uh, uh, from starting with lecture two. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last portion of the course deals with Constantine's conversion, his efforts to build a Christian monarchy, Christian institutions, the pagan reaction under his nephew Julian, and the final efforts to Christianize the Roman world. And we conclude with the reign of the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, where the Roman world has become decidedly Christian in both numbers and culture. This is our task and this is what is before us for the next 24 lectures, and it is, without a doubt, one of the great uh, issues of the Western tradition.